for waterfowl that are rehabbed and then consumed by people, is there any residual contamination in tissue that could be a consumption hazard? No. Maybe. I know during deep water, I can't I can't speak to it directly, but I know during deep water, um, they were they were doing uh, health and human safety surveys. Uh, so, you know, where hunting was allowed, I think they did capture some of those um, those animals and took the meat, paid the hunters for the meat or whatever. And, um, I don't know what happened with that data. There were no bans on eating waterfowl or things like that. So, Gina, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that was handled by Jim McCord. Okay. And it did happen in Louisiana. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just as a follow up to that. Um, I think early on um, that first fall, fall 2010, um, I think the states and, and the partners worked together with USDA um, and to put some water on the landscape in the hopes of short stopping some of the birds north of the impact area. Um, and there, there's been a couple of uh, final reports from that work. They, um, folks at Mississippi State, I think, had a bunch of graduate students, and they did a bunch of monitoring of those um, flooded sites further north, and results are pretty impressive. Now, I don't know what that, what effect that quote short stopping had on actual harvest uh, bag limits and, and estimated total bird shot in, in Louisiana and not, but. There was definitely an effort, concerted effort, to try and shortstop the birds, at least in 2010, I think in 2011. And John, I think Jim is, Dr. LaCour is the one that has the oil spill bans. We have actually put bans that say, call this number, this bird was oiled. I don't, you know, we've done it a couple of times. Yes, you beat me to it, Ron, that I was uh, been texting back with Laura. And she's like, please let them know that we put that on the birds. Okay. Very good. See, I didn't know that. Good. Well, I'd like to say down there, so Noah, all the secret studies that were performed during deep water indicated there was no human health exposure issues from the infectious issues. So we addressed fish because we had to prove that we could um, inject the fish and that would be valid. And um, FDA pulled into um, assessing musculature, um, which has a lower fat content and lower oil content. Um, and it's different if you include liver and gut with that. It's much higher. The total body oil is higher. So um, I, that's fish, though. I, I, right, usually, yeah, for sure. Can, can I ask a question? Of course. Yeah. So it's actually. Um, uh, for um, Laird Hankel. Um, so I missed, I couldn't actually hear the number you said. You said that in California you have a, when birds are admitted to the facility, there's how many are released or how many are taken to release? What percentage? Are you there? Can you hear me? I he, I, he's here. I'm not sure if we can hear him. I have him on Larry, if you can't speak, uh, you can't speak out loud chat to me, what you want to chat with someone. Did he turn the speaker back up? <laughs> 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 uh, he turned it off because he was getting back to you. I'm not sure if you heard the question. He's, um, I have him unmuted on his end. He's still online. Um, he said there, maybe we should hear something else. Okay, yeah, let's do that and try that. All right, so sorry. All right, that's okay. Yeah, he's, he's supposed to be on the news, but for some reason, he can't hear him. Does anyone? Oh, so the people online can hear him, we just can't hear him. Because we are no longer, I don't know, no longer have the Zoom open online. That's the problem. Okay. Well, that's okay. We will, well, Larry, thank you for um, explaining the folks online. Um, we'll try to figure out how we can get it the folks here as well. Um, okay, in the meantime, um, is there, while we're working on that technical issue, okay, while we're working on that technical issue,
Uh, does anyone in the room have another question for the, the speakers? Uh, or, uh, and then you? Gina, when, when y'all are talking about choosing restoration sites for a NERDA settlement, are y'all bound by the state magic plan? No. As a state agency? No, we, we would want to be consistent with it. So there are restorations that have been proposed, restoration projects that have been proposed that are consistent with the master plan, but not in it. They're not listed in there, but they're consistent with it. Those are the ones that we want well, that, to stick That's to. kind of where I was going, because you've seen quicker projects that are proposed, but they're not consistent with the same master plan. Your project would have to be at least consistent. Right. right. We strive to be consistent. Yeah, we can't do it. Sorry. So Laird's going to have to chat his answers. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, continue with no, that. I think I answered it. Yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah they, some of the projects that we actually consider are not listed in the plan, but they're consistent. All right. I think you had a question next. Yes. Uh, I have a question to the uh, When we're talking about the birds dying in the oil spills, uh, are there specific metrics that are used, such as like a necropsy or something like that, to be to prove what uh, the effect oil had on the impact that and what are the specific protocols to do that? No, so I, I don't think there's um there's any one metric. Uh, I think for NRDA, we are looking at the the spill. The response actions, the what type of oil, all the things that we can possibly. What is the story? You know, even if there's scare cannons out there, we want to know where the scare cannons are because those might be displacing animals that are that that that's their foraging range, and they're going to have to go uh, somewhere and maybe you know cut into somebody else's foraging territory, and there's going to be some some fighting there. So I mean, we're trying to look at all of it and tell the big, tell the big story. What's the, what's the story there? Um, and there's no one, one metric that's going to work to cover everything. Uh, Sabrina, uh, this is a question for Jeff Leesman. I'm glad that there's going to be some more serious monitoring. So maybe we will have some new baseline data in the future, but how stable is the funding for that? Like how long will we be able to undertake monitoring? Yeah, the period of performance for this project ends in 2020. Um, if we use, there, there's a similar program in Atlantic, and that was initially funded in 2010, and that, that funding is still coming through. Um, we're hoping that you know, the same sort of effort will, um, will continue, you know, beyond 2020, but the period of performance ends in uh, spring of 2020. So, yeah. Okay, um, so we have Laird Hinkle on the phone right now so that we can hear his uh, his response to Kendall's question earlier. So Kendall, if you could just remind us of what your question was and we're going to get Laird on speakerphone to share with everyone. Sure. Oh, no, no, he's going to he's gonna okay. talk. You just so, ask your question. I'm just trying to dig in a little bit on the rehab numbers that, um, and see if there's an update. So, firstly, I had not. Um, I actually couldn't hear the number. So, of the birds submitted to the rehab facility, what percentage are released? So, you can answer now, Larry. Okay. Say something again. Can you hear me okay? Can y'all hear me? Okay, I'm getting lots of nods. You're good. Okay. So, um, well, so that you, so I can't hear you. Okay. Um, I said that um, well over 50% of birds that go into rehab typically get released. Um, in reality, I think it's here in California, at least on recent bills, it's been more like 75% of birds that um, get through rehab and can be released. But that can vary depending on a lot of different factors, just, you know, based on different species, the build, weather, different types of years. Um, and we're hoping to um, actually work up some data on that with 
um, the oil plant led care network here in California. So I don't have um, hard date on that. There aren't many published studies on that topic, but it's obviously a, a topic to document. And it might also be a good question for Rhonda. I don't know if Rhonda um, has an indication of what the, the release rate was for Deepwater Horizon. That data is held by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm looking at Barrett right now. <laughs> you can actually go online and find those numbers under how to get to it exactly. I don't know, but it is on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service website. Um, for me, well, for instance, the one spill I did recently was 100% release rate. It depends, and then I've had spills where it's 50, some where it's 20, and that's all been determined by how quickly we got there, how quickly we collected the animals, got them out of the environment, and also um, the species. Sure. Um, so I know Chris Fiorello at OWCN was trying to do follow-up on reproductive status, and she had a brown pelican project going. She had a brown pelican project going that um, she had really good survivability, um, and these were animals that were really carefully screened with CBC chems um, when she put them out there, but within a year or two years, zero birds had actually reproduced. So um, I'm wondering, I haven't heard follow-up on that study since probably 2016. So I'm wondering if there's any tracking on that study or, or additions to that. Yeah, I can address that question. Um, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Laird. Um, yeah. Breaking up a little bit. It's the room. Oh, it's the what? room. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, I keep going. Yes, now you can go back. It's just the room gets bad cell reception. Questions in the room? Uh, Andy. I had a question for Gina and Eva about the restoration project where y'all are creating a restoring green habitat. I'm glad to see some monitoring beyond the you know, elevation of vegetation. Are y'all getting to monitor that success on all those projects or a subset that are easily accessible? Or? That might be better for John Weave to. Um, Specifically, the islands and the deep water horizon restoration project. I'm not sure what the monitoring plan is at. Um, yeah, Andy, uh, that goes to uh, kind of conversations that we had coming out of the injury assessment. Uh, and Michael alluded to it in his course. Um, yes, we did have trend information, but you know, it didn't get more fine as far as looking at associated uplift, productivity, just based on where things were, establishing baseline, all of those influence. 
we didn't really feel like we had anything bondability appropriate for that. Um, so for the colonials at this point, um, where we utilize uh, Glenn Ford's aerial um, surveys and guiding protocols, because they had gone through, I can't imagine how many lawyers looked at all of that and they all thought oh, that's so weird, it was good. <laughs> Um, and so, and so the idea is that it, it's going to be able to address a number of different influences, certainly for, um, for the discussions like this when we're talking about oil spills, as far as our ability now to not be limited, like Michael was talking about, for accessing those islands, we will have the ability to go back, pull that information right off the shelf and say, this is what these areas generate at this point, as well as full on production and, and what have you. So it certainly gives us a very good tool in our toolbox um, for that. That's specific for, we are having conversations about marsh birds, uh, about our way to, uh, again, uh, address uh, much of the difficulty that we had, say with marsh birds, for Deepwater Horizon, dead bird database, there were only 35 flat reels that were killed in Deepwater Horizon, according to that. And again, those are bird names. Uh, but we know based on uh, no oil and maps and just doing some uh, generic life history information that we're probably just like for example our species we're looking at anywhere between 55 to 65 thousand birds uh, let alone full on production and everything else associated thereof so the idea behind uh, where we were hoping to go um, and I think you know, as you know um, is we're looking at getting very basic specific with that uh, because we know that these areas are certainly dynamic, um, but the idea is if we have oiling in these particular areas, we can't go back in and identify losses like this, but we should be able to harness this type of information uh, based on uh, modeling and what have you, so that we can easily come back. We're having conversations with Gina and, and be able to identify losses and associated output that we can need from future restoration. And there's a number of online questions. All right. Um, do the panelists see a potential value in incorporating OMICS techniques such as environmental DNA for assessing or complementing survey data? Thank you. I'm a scientist at heart. Always want data, always want to collect more information. Uh, specifically, um, I'm not familiar with those techniques, OCS. Oh, uh, she was saying omics, like like proteomics or things of that nature. I think, right, was that omics? I, I, I don't know. It was spelled out in all caps, O-M-I-C-S, omics. Yeah, omics. Do you know that one? Uh, if it's DNA, uh, environmental DNA type analyses, um, certainly they could be used, I would think, for diet type studies, but um, possibly for aquatic organisms. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't hurt to have more data, obviously. Um, immediately for birds, just birds in general, I, I don't know that I would immediately uh, uh, think of a use other than diet. I imagine there's a lot with genomics. Um, are there? Yes, hold on. Um, so the next question is for Gina Eva, what are the standards used to determine the wildlife rehabilitation priorities in an oil spill worst case scenario, like more than 200 impacted animals in rehabilitation simultaneously? Can you say that again? What? Um, what are the standards used to determine the wildlife rehabilitation priorities in a worst case scenario, like if there are more than 200 impacted animals in rehabilitation simultaneously, how do you, how do you uh, triage them, I guess? You do that. Well, definitely we triage them, but we, we have had more than 200 birds in rehab at a time. Um, we bring in additional rehabilitators. We get the proper facility, proper facility um, and the proper people. Um, 
I mean, we can rehabilitate a lot more than 200 at a time. Thank you. Um, so the the breadth with the pelicans, so it was over a thousand pelicans, but brought in live was probably 600. Um, not all of those survived, obviously. So I would say, gosh, that was a long time ago. Um, we probably rehabilitated four to 500. And again, they did not all make it to release, but that was a lot of birds in that warehouse. And we also had a lot of people there. We had, uh, when well, we brought in the rehabilitators from the West Coast, East Coast and the Gulf Coast. All right, we've got uh, one more question online, and then I'll make a couple of announcements. Um, and online, I have posted a link to our um, a survey about today that is in the chat section online. So if you're still watching online, if you can go make a quick copy and paste of that survey or click the link, we'd appreciate it. Yeah, also it's it's available in your welcome packet, which I emailed to you, the, the PDF. Um, so this is the last question online. I am a 40 year bird rehabilitator on St. Croix in the Virgin Islands. Our large refinery is becoming larger and we also have a new pipeline. We would love to have you set up a training program here and review our situation. Who would I contact to set that up? You are all welcome. Yes, and uh, yes, I would love to come to St. Croix, and um, I have other additional rehabilitators that I work with, and some really good planners. So you need a really good plan, and know how to pull that plan together. If you and, and I do know that there's a lot of product about to be moving in there. So yeah, you, should, you have a reason to be concerned. Okay, well, I would like to uh, say thank you to our online participants. Uh, Tara has told me that today our peak number of online participants was between 40 to 50 people. So that's pretty decent. Um, and also we were competing, I don't know if you, if you all realize, besides the fact that we were competing with Mardi Gras, which you all know we take it very seriously in the state. I'm not even from uh, Louisiana and I, yeah, I've come to love it as my own. But uh, yeah, so it's a big deal that a lot of you are missing the festivities. So thank you for joining. Also, um, we were also competing with their store council meetings, which because of the shutdown are occurring in Baton Rouge today. So I wanted to thank you all for choosing to come with us. Um, Laird actually answered online. Oh, Laird insult. Yes, I'm sorry. Right here on the phone, I didn't read. Um, he said that 612 um, were cleaned and released during Deepwater Horizon. And to add to the triage question, threatened and endangered species would typically get, typically get highest priority. And after that, the priority would go to animals with the good prognosis. Okay, so there's also that information which Laird has, Laird has relayed to us through Tara. Um, but I just wanted to thank you all for, for coming. Um, I'm going to say goodbye to the people online and then sit tight for a moment, the people in the room, because I have additional announcements for you.